Mom, how are you? I'm well. Nice to see you. Hello. What are you going to be talking about today? I'm going to be talking about um, what's inside of us. And um, does it show? Scripture? My scripture is Acts 17. Um, Seventeen, twenty-two through thirty-one. Where are you? I'm God, no. Okay. About what's inside? Is this a test? You made me nervous. Huh? Is this a test? I got nervous. Here. Okay, thank you.
Bobby and Warren are back. <laughs> I just looked over and saw them, and I just had to rejoice. It's good to have you all back. Um, we will not be having a covered dish dinner next Sunday. That's our normal fourth Sunday meal. And uh, we are, there's so much going on with Memorial Day weekend and with graduation and so forth that we will not have uh, that meal. And I notice that's one of those things that kind of slips up on some of us when we have a change like that. Somebody will bring a, uh, a, a dish and say, well, I thought we were having dinner. If that happens in your case, let, let me know. I'll be glad to take that off your hands and uh, you won't have to carry that burden alone. But we will not be having our regular fourth Sunday covered dish dinner uh, next Sunday. What have you done with Sandy? Sandy is in Fort Worth. Her uh, sister, Anita, is uh, selling her house there near TCU. And Sandy uh, has come to help her stage the house and get it ready for viewing and so forth. So uh, she's uh, busy with her. We, she's, we've been in touch, though. She's been giving me directions so that. <laughs> I can stay uh, stay on track. Also, we are receiving some uh, uh, recipes that uh, are uh, going into our new cookbook. Sandy has included her recipe and her mom's recipe for uh, corn casserole. I know some others of you make corn casserole, but uh, Sandy's mother's casserole is special in our family. We, but she used to make it at church dinners in Arlington, and Sandy has continued to make it. And Sandy is including it as a, uh, a contribution to the church cookbook. And finally, I have put down on paper my recipe for East Texas hickory smoked brisket. So we look forward, and I tell you what, if we have a lot of other recipes come in, Maybe in the next the next time we have a church dinner, I will make my East Texas hickory smoked brisket and bring it to the church dinner. If we have those recipes come in, so uh, I'm going to be monitoring to see. Yes, uh, Melba. I just wanted to say, Ken also has put in New Mexico green chili stew recipe in there and chili. What's it? Carne Right. Also, I wanted to tell the ladies, please, please get us our recipes in. We're wanting to get them in by the end of July so that we can take advantage of a discount per cookbook mm -hmm. that would amount to quite a bit in August. So if we can get it printed in August, we'll save a lot of money. So get your recipes in because it takes time to get them in. Well, thank you for reminding us of that, Melba. You heard that. Melba says so we need to get these recipes in no later than the end of July so that we can take advantage of an August discount. And I am hereby dropping the corn casserole recipe in the book and the East Texas hickory smoked brisket recipe. And you know what that gives me the right to do. I can start leaning on people now. <laughs> for those, yes. In regard to that, we may need them in before the end of June to, so that they can organize them to get them printed in August. Okay, so let's target the end of June. That's a good uh, That's a good way to approach that, uh, Kathy. Why don't we say by the end of June, we'll have all these recipes in. Dr. Allen, I know you've got some good recipes, so. don't <laughs> you? We look and forward to And her helper, I'll that. And her helper, all right, Miranda. I won't be too hard on you, but uh, but believe me, it'll be easier for you to get the recipe in than listen to me talk, all right? <laughs> We're having fun, and we'll get this job done. Uh, by the way, uh, we celebrated the life of Arvinell uh, Newton McLaren yesterday. I was not in Austin, but uh, several family members were, and I understand there was a great celebration of Arvinell's life. There was. There was a lot of people. Wonderful. And I don't know, I, I imagine, does Arvinell have recipes in any of our church cookbooks going back? I think probably would. I'm going to look in there. Yeah. Pastor, Pastor she, she also has, some of you remember the con conference, North Texas Conference, put out a book several years ago called The Ties That Bind, and it was selected memories of anyone who wanted to submit a selected memory 
And Arvinel was one of those <laughs> selected. It's wonderful. If you, I think we should have a copy maybe in our library of that book. It may still in, be in print, I'm not sure. But uh, it, it is a wonderful, wonderful memory from many years ago that happened right here at this church. And I recommend all of you try to find that. Maybe it's online, I don't know. But the, the title is a Ties that Bind, The Ties That Bind. And it was published by the conference, North Texas Conference. All right, thank you so much, Joe, Dan. And, um, Johnson. Yes. If, if you remember, when our mail was she had a hat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, she was, in her circles, she was called a hat lady. The hat lady. <laughs> and the girls went through her bedroom and got all the hats that they thought would be all of it <laughs> and put them on the tables. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you kept them. And my daughter talked them out of one red hat. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Angela? Yeah. All right, all right. Why am I not surprised? Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, my friend Wayne's here, and he's got a recipe for fava beans. And uh, you all write up your recipe. I should do that. All right, all right. All right, well, you, you get, you're getting the point. So to keep me quiet, to shut me up, get those recipes in. All right. Any other announcements we need to make? Whispering Pines, is it today? Yes, thank you so much for reminding me. The church uh, will be going to Whispering Pines uh, Nursing Home, I believe it's called, today. And the meeting will be at what time, Sarah? Three o'clock. At three o'clock. And uh, we'll be um, meeting Pat Hollingsworth there, who will be playing. And uh, the church members who can go will be singing. And uh, I think, Sarah, you have a message prepared for that, for that service. Yes. Yes, uh, Jen and I have to be in Sulphur Springs at a district meeting in preparation for our annual conference. But if you're able, we invite you to be at uh, Whispering Pines at 3 o'clock uh, with that group today. T tell us again uh, the title of your message, Sarah, and the scripture. Um, the title of my message is... <laughs> Knowing God. Making God known, and it's Acts 17, verses 22 through 31. And oddly enough, it will tie into the exact exact scripture that Chauncey will be using this morning. Wonderful, wonderful. Sarah does a good job. She's a mind reader. She knows what I'm thinking and does a good job of tying in. So That's God, dangerous. It is, it is. God bless you as you go forth with the church group. Uh, David may or may not be able to make it. He and uh, Molly had a a difficult time last night. So uh, when, at our prayer time, we'll be remembering that. Any other announcements that uh, you can think of? All right. Let's uh, move forward in our service to welcome to all of you. Many uh, were uh, not able to come for various reasons. Uh, the weather we've had, and I know some are still recovering from traveling to Austin to be at the service for our Manel. And others are unable to be here for various reasons, but uh, it's good to look out on your faces. We thank God for you. And uh, Bobby and Warren, you're back from, I think you know you've been back for a while from Nebraska. You took your mom back. And uh, how are things going? Uh, we have support for her. She's staying at home because that's where she wants to be. But we, she agreed to have the life alert. She doesn't always have it with her, but yeah. she agreed to that. And so we have people checking on her, and she's home where she's happy. Good. So good. That's well, good. I'm glad Mrs. Epperly is able to be uh, happy, and that y'all are taking such good care of her. And uh, we'll be praying for her. When she lets us. What is the lesson? Pastor? Yes. What are the. Uh, unusual things up in Nebraska. A lot of people down here are not familiar with the four-letter word snow. <laughs> but at the end of April, we were there on Sunday and had six inches of snow blowing 20, 30 miles an hour, a genuine blizzard. And a tree came down in mom's backyard and knocked out the power. Fortunately, Bobby and Bobby's brother lives about 20 miles away Sunday night, so we drove to spend the night there knowing we wouldn't have power back. And if you've ever watched the old movies like uh, Fargo and the <laughs> wind blowing and you can see forever on the plains, beyond your headlights not so much and driving 20 miles an hour 
like an old man. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you all made it through safely and uh, got uh, separately taken care of and you're back here. I don't envy you going through that snow. I remember a Minnesota snowstorm I was in one time. That's as close as I want to get to some of that stuff. Glad to have you back. Uh, and I think everybody else is uh, regulars here. Well, Peyton's not a regular. She is a member here, but my oh, granddaughter Peyton. Peyton Smith. Hello, Peyton. Good to see you. <laughs> We're so glad you decided She's to been here visiting. join the family this morning. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, move on. We are moving toward our opening hymn, which is in our hymn book, number 530. One that I think you all know, the hymn, Are You Able? Number 530. <laughs> Uh, you might uh, 
if you have occasion, give David a call and let him know the church is praying for him, for both of them. I think he would uh, appreciate that. Well, I received word about the uh, death of uh, one of our firefighters in the community and the response. Joe, do you want to mention something about that? Uh, I just got word of it last night. I really don't know the details. Um, he died at home. Uh, don't know what of. It wasn't that he was fighting a fire or anything, but he was a good guy, real good guy. Yeah. He taught Sarah and I our ET or our uh, EMT. EMT class, and he was very well acted. Bobby Don. Bobby Don. What's his last name? I don't remember. He's in Perryville. Good guy. Bobby Don. Uh, we don't have his last name, but uh, I understand. I've was in Sunday school with uh, with the youth, and Jacob mentioned that his son was one of the first responders to respond to his father's death. And yes. That must be challenging. We pray for, for that family. <laughs> and for the family of uh, Arvanel uh, Newton, as they mourn the loss, continually mourn the loss of, uh, of Arvanel, and uh, may they rejoice in uh, the blessing that she brought to so many and in the fact that, that she's in the hands of a loving God. Other prayer concerns and other joys. Yes, Mel? I think it's Josie. Josie, I'm sorry. Did you have your hand up? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my EKG thirst Wednesday was not acceptable, so I have to go back to the Heart Institute tomorrow and go through all those tests. Then they will let me know if I'm eligible for surgery. Well, God bless you as you go through that medical process. The doctors these days are being very careful if there's anything that counterindicates a surgical procedure, but it uh, proposed, uh, imposes additional hardship on the patient sometimes. God bless you. Thank you. Joe? So, I would appreciate if everybody could continue playing, praying for the Sanders family. Uh, as you remember, they lost her little baby uh, a week ago, and they seem to be doing much better. Uh, I talked with him for about three hours last night, and he's dealing with it, uh, but just continue prayer. We lift him up in prayer and give thanks that you were able to be in touch to encourage. Other prayer concerns. We want to play, pray for Miss Epperly as she makes adjustments there to living in uh, new circumstances and praise God for her faith, her uh, determination. I oh, guess I'm sorry, Kate. I have two sisters, one in equipment and uh, in bad health, heart problems, and age, and then another sister in Chandler, and she is showing first signs of Alzheimer's on set. So. We need prayers, please. We lift them up to the Lord. Lift them up. And while we're remembering people, uh, I, uh, this is not a immediate uh, relative, but somebody we've gone pro close to. My sister is married to uh, a guy from Utah. And uh, uh, last year, just as I was coming on board here, we drove, we helped him drive to Utah to see his father, who'd been ill for some time. Well, he died uh, yesterday, and uh, we, uh, the family is mourning that. He was a, a wonderful uh, Christian gentleman who's, uh, you know, he knew that, you know, it was time for him to get some rest, but he'll still, still be missed, and they have a very, very large family, so they'll be gathering, and they'll be mourning uh, dad and grandpa, so we pray uh, for the family of Mr. Ward in Orem, Utah. Yes, Ken. The Como Pittman School District is preparing to change the man tomorrow, so to speak, uh, for getting a new superintendent. And I am personally excited because not just indications, proof and writing, he is a Christian. Good. Uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunities of serving for him. I don't think the school district will be better for him. We lift up the uh, Como Picton School District and ask for blessings for the incoming superintendent and for the team that will be supporting him. 
By the way, I got a chance to meet with the city administrator from um, in Winsboro, Craig Lindholm, who's been on board here since about September of last year. We had lunch together this week, and uh, we want to lift him up in prayer and our city staff. And while we're doing that, also uh, our, our government, uh, we pray for our nation uh, during times that are increasingly uh, challenging. Lord help. Esther, I need all the help I can get to. We, we lift you up in prayer. It's not as, not as easy to do things as it no, used to be. No, not hardly. All right. But we, we do ask God's blessing in those challenging times when muscles seem to not work the way they used to. But we also give thanks that you have a will to be in church each Sunday whenever you can. That's a blessing to us. And it's a blessing to me. Praise God. The, uh, right now, the, the leading mother of the church. Some of these ladies are challenging you, but you're the leading mother of Tenny Chapel right now. Matriarch. The matriarch. The matriarch. <laughs> there, while we're doing this, I guess it helps to yeah, pray for Yeah, mother superior. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it really helps to pray for churches. I know of one church that had... Thank you, Doc. Uh, the designated mothers of the church and there was some debate about who was the first mother. <laughs> so we, we pray for churches as they deal with the, the circumstances that they face. If there are no other prayer concerns to lift up at this time, let's go to God in prayer together. Lord, we do rejoice because of your goodness, your love, your kindness, and all the wonderful things you have done and that we trust you will do. We give you thanks for being a, a gracious God. But Lord, as we rejoice, we also feel some pain and some strain in our lives. We have lost people who are, are dear to us and those we counted on to be there. And now they have gone on. So we need your help, and families need your help as they mourn. For others of us, Lord, who are facing the changes of life, we ask your help. For Josie, as she deals with the additional medical procedures that she will have to endure, we ask your blessing. For Ms. Frankie, as she deals with her circumstances, we ask your blessing. And for all others who we may not name today aloud, we ask you, Lord, to let them know that your loving hand is extended for them and that you are ready to take their hand and lead them on and to help them stand through challenging circumstances. Lord, let us all have faith in your loving kindness. Bless our nation, our city, our state, and bless other nations of this world. Lord, we pray that this world will become more fully what you want it to be. And we will continue to call upon you in the way that your son Jesus has taught us to. We will pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and live and the glory forever. Amen. God, you tenderly care for each person you have created. You miraculously restore people to health and shine light into the lives of those who are discouraged. Guide us so that we will not regard others according to outward appearances, but seek to find your love in their hearts. 
we dedicate our offerings and ourselves to contribute to the work of your kingdom on earth until Christ returns in glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Oh, Allie says she can. Well, if you didn't have superpowers, could you have done it? So why is it hard to see through this through the outside? Because of that lovely gold bracket. That's right. <laughs> because it's it's covered up. And sometimes you can guess, and sometimes not. So today, Pastor Chauncey is going to talk to us about a guy in the Bible named Paul. <coughs> Anyone ever heard of him? I hope so. Okay. Um, so Paul went on a bunch of different journeys. And in one of his trips, he went to Athens, Greece. Who do you think lived in Athens, Greece? The Greeks. That's right. The Greeks lived in Athens, Greece. And Paul wandered around the city, and he saw that they had a statue. And the statue was labeled, and the label of the statue said, To the Unknown God. Do you have any idea what that might have meant to the unknown God? That's right, they weren't sure. And what they were saying is they thought there might be a God out there, but they weren't for sure what it was. So, the Greeks were saying, we don't know anything about this, but we just want to cover our bases and be sure. That's kind of like this gift box. We think, you, you think there's something in it, right? I could have someone out there with a um, tape recorder that's playing a, a tape every time I shake it. You think? I think he said no one's quick enough to <laughs> press the button. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. So God decided that they, they must have questions. So he decided to talk to them and he told them all about Jesus. And he here's what he told them. He told them that my God created everything, my God gave life to everything that's living, and he told them that they were sons and daughters of my God. So, what Paul told them, he, you know, the, the, sold the um, statue that was unlabeled. He was telling them what the statue was about, just like I'm going to be telling you what is in the box, or what was... Molly said was already in the box. Okay, so Paul told them something new. How do you think they react? We've talked about this before. Last week we talked about a guy who told people new things and they stoned him. Do you remember that? And they killed him. So this week, Paul told, told them something new. Do you think they were happy about it? Yes. What do you think? Nope. Some people didn't care. Some people had more questions and some people believed. The people that believed received the gift that Paul was offering them, and they received it because they believed. We too can help each other get to know God even better than we already do. That is our good news for today. Whenever we share what we know about God, it's like unwrapping a gift and sharing it with the people around us. So I want you guys to focus this week on being helping unwrap the gift that you have inside of you so other people around you can see Let's pray, and then we'll see what's in the box. This week what we're going to do is I'm going to say a line, and then you guys say a line. Okay? And everyone can join us. Dear God. Dear God. I'm sorry, repeat the line after me. <laughs> Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for learning about you. Thank you for learning about you. Thank you for reminding us. Thank you for reminding us. That your love. That your love. Is like receiving a gift. It's like receiving a gift. That we can unwrap that we can unwrap and share with those around us. And share with those around us. Amen. Amen. Okay. Put your skinny arms in there and see what you can get out. <laughs> Treat. Hmm? What about that sweet treat? They're all in the box. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's too big to pass around. Thank you, Sarah, for helping us prepare to hear the word of God today about the Athenians as Paul came before them and preached the gospel. The story is found in the 17th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Today we'll be reading from verses 22 through 31, and um, 
quite an interesting um, presentation Paul makes uh, regarding the people of Athens. Let's listen together for the word of God. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, or an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the time of human ignorance, he now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which we will have the, he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead the word of God for the people of God thank you please be seated I invite you to join me in a time of silent prayer as we invite God to guide us in our understanding of the scripture that has been read Amen. What Paul did when he preached this sermon to the people of Athens was to make a connection with them. He knew that they were people who were inquiring about uh, God and about religion, and their understanding is that there were, must be many gods. There must be a God who rules over the sun, and there must be a God of the moon, there must be a God of the stars, perhaps one for each of the stars. And they built altars to these gods. On the front of your worship bulletin is one of the uh, altar shrines uh, that stands today, or at least part of it, in the city of Athens. It's known as the Parthenon, this uh, structure with all of the, the columns. Uh, some years ago, I was in Athens, and we went up to the Parthenon, and just to the left of this structure, the Parthenon, is a limestone rock, a, a high hill, that is known as the Areopagus. That was a public gathering place. I, we understand it was one, at one time where court sessions were held, but uh, it was in the shadow of the Parthenon where Paul stood at this Areopagus, this limestone hill, and he talked about God. And as I said, he made a connection because he knew the people were interested in God. So he got their attention. And he pointed out this uh, altar that had been built, apparently by someone who wanted to make sure no God had been left out of their worship. The altar that Paul said read to an unknown God. And Paul said, oh, what a lead in. I, I, I think I know what to tell them now. This God, whom you worship as unknown, that's the God that I want to tell you about. This is the God who made all of us. 
and he went on to talk about the nature of God, and he said some amazing things. I mean, we could benefit in this world today if we took seriously what Paul said. He said, for example, that God made everyone from one ancestor. Now, that was revolutionary. That's, that's something that uh, we kind of tend to pass over. What that means is that Wayne and I are brothers. Sometimes we, we fuss and fight like brothers. I, I think maybe that's true. We have, we have our ups and downs. Uh, but that means that I'm a brother to Charles. To Charles? What yes, that means? <laughs> <laughs> what that means is that we are all related. Already there is the implication we have a basis for getting along with one another. We have a basis for loving one another. We have a basis for living together as the children of God. Now, if we really took that seriously, wouldn't that get us beyond some of the troubles that we have today? We all come from one ancestor. We are all offspring of God. So we have reason to get along together, no matter what your orientations may be, no matter the color of your skin, no matter what you like or dislike, we are sisters and brothers. Now, we might argue like sisters and brothers, and you know how we do sometimes. But there's an old saying about that, that sisters and brothers will argue. But most times, most of the time, they won't really hurt each other. They won't do any serious damage. The trouble comes if you get in the middle of sisters and brothers who are arguing, you might get hurt. Amen. So we, uh, what, what Paul's saying is that when we argue, when we disagree, when we have differences, let's remember that we're called to be sisters and brothers together. And, of course, Paul goes on to talk about, uh, and God has overlooked some of the things that we have done because he understood we had not heard the word of God. God's willing to forgive some of the ugly things we've done. But uh, Paul goes on to say, God has now fixed a day when you and I will be judged. And the one he's appointed to judge us is the one who died on the cross for our sins, and God raised him up from the dead. Already, that's a powerful, powerful message. And that's the message that he offered to the people at Athens on that day. Now, I want to point out to you that the church is still trying to make a similar connection with people. We go about it in different ways. We don't see um, temples that have been erected to various gods in Winsburg. There might be some stuff like that in Dallas. You know how they are. They're different. But we don't see that kind of thing in Winsburg. But we have to find other ways of making connections with people. And we do. The church, I want, want you to recognize that some of the things the church does. We have ways of making connections with people through the music that we offer. We sing some of the songs of the faith. And we uh, try to help to cap capture people's imagination in song. Uh, are you able to be a faithful follower of the Lord? Do you believe in Him? Are you able to devote yourself to His service? But we have other ways as well. I was at the Praise and Gospel Night last night, and I was interested that uh, Joe Dan Boyd sang a song that really was on target for the message that I had prepared to reach. Um, the song was one of the old songs of the faith. You remember that song, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning? Uses the image, imagery of a ship that's out on the sea, and there are... Um, there are lights that have been uh, planted along the shoreline, lighthouses, to help the ships come in. But Joe Dan sang last night, we need for the lower lights to be burning because there are some seamen out there that you and I might need to rescue, that you and I might need to save. We are all sisters and brothers, so it is appropriate that we be concerned about the other sailors who are out on the sea. In fact, that is our task as the church of Jesus Christ. Let those lower lights be burning. You and I, as the church, are trying to make connections with people. 
And uh, that's why we gather together and we sing songs like that in order to let people know that we worship a God who calls us to be a blessing, a help to our sisters and brothers, and we invite others to worship that same God. But it got more interesting last night. I was interested, not only at, uh, do we sing uh, gospel songs at praise and gospel nights, we get to, to hear a good many uh, secular songs. And guess what we got to hear last night? I wish I could uh, channel George Strait and sing this for you, but uh, Doc Davis uh, was up last night and he sang the song Amarillo by Morning. Up from San Antonio. Everything that I got is just what I got on. And he painted that portrait of a, a cowboy who was on a journey. Said he'd be, by noon, he'd be bucking in, uh, in Amarillo. And he'd be hoping that uh, he'd make that eight second ride so he could qualify for the prize. And he talked to uh, Doc Davis in singing that song, talked about the challenges that the cowboy had gone through. Didn't he get his saddle stolen in Houston? And uh, broke a leg in, where was it? Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Santa Fe. And um, it got really interesting. It got really earthy because somewhere along the way he had lost a wife and a girlfriend. And we, you know, we always speculate what, how that all played <laughs> out. But um, he played that song. And I, I said to myself, now that's appropriate in this setting because he's talking about real life. Things that people go through in life. But then I got happy when I heard Mike Dodgen sing a song. I don't remember all the words, but he talked about God's blessing that is always with us. And the song paired well with Amarillo by Morning because the message was, as we travel through life, we can count on God to meet us at every turn. Amen. No matter what challenges, no matter what difficulties we face, we can count on God if we will come to believe in Him as Paul preached to those Athenians. We too preach to the people of this community and the people of this world who are on their own kind of journey, going through all kinds of things. Some have been to the Folsom prisons in Winsboro. Some have um, been at the bars of Fort Worth. I'm thinking about another George Strait song. This one was not uh, sung last night. Does Fort Worth ever cross your mind? You know that one? Fort Worth, ever cross your mind, this guy had lost his wife. She'd gone to Dallas with another man. And I'm not making this up. Some of you look surprised. <laughs> this, this, this is real music now. Gone to Dallas with another man, and uh, he was drinking in, at a Fort Worth bar, and he found out that cold Fort Worth beer don't solve your problem. What we proclaim is for people who are seeking answers in life who are seeking a way to make it through the challenges that they face, we have found a God who is able to help us. We don't claim that we got it all together, do we? No, we, we don't have it all together. But we do know someone who can hold us together and guide us into the blessings that God has for us, no matter what the journey of life may bring. We also strive to make connections with people, not only through the music we offer, but uh, through the food that we serve. And I make reference to this from time to time. That's why we serve Easter breakfast. That's why we serve that uh, lunch at Christmas. We, everybody needs to eat. And what we are saying when we invite people to come is that we worship a God who provides the things that we need to live. And this God is able to strengthen us and help us through all the challenges that we face. That's why we serve those meals that we do. And by the way, um, we do a lot of internal work in the church through the meals that we serve. My grandfather, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you, my grandfather gave me an explanation of why churches have as many meals as we do. He pulled me aside one day. I was in training as a, to be a minister in the church, at his church in, in Dallas. And uh, he said, Steve, you know why we have all these meals at the church? And I knew he wanted to tell me something. I said, no, Daddy, I don't know. I don't know. He said, the reason we have all these meals in the church 
is that it's hard to stay mad at somebody when you sit down and eat with them. They are designed, you see, to help people get over the challenges, that they have, the tensions that they have between them. They are designed to help people be reconciled to one another. They are designed so that God's Spirit can move as people sit down together as sisters and brothers over a meal. And I remembered, uh, I remember that lesson. That's one to learn. And you know, it, it occurred to me. We think about how we make connections with people in order to make God known to people. When we have funeral meals, I've always been impressed with churches that served a meal to bereaved families. And uh, I worked up a little uh, speech that I always give when we get back to the fellowship hall or family life center or wherever that meal is served. I said, now, we want to say grace now, but we also want to thank God for the hands of these people who have prepared this meal because they are extending those hands to you and they are saying that God is going to provide. God is going to provide in your time of loss, your time of difficulty. We worship a God who is able to bless us through it all. That is the kind of message that we send through the meals that we serve and that we prepare. We are trying to make the love of God known. And I could go on. It's about five minutes till 12. And... Uh, some of you are saying he ought to be finished about now, so um, I'll move on. There is a wonderful story uh, that appeared in the Upper Room Devotional Guide um, this week, as a matter of fact, on Wednesday of this past week, about uh, a man who made God known by making a connection uh, with a child. Uh, do you remember the days when there were guys who would come along the streets in ice cream trucks? The ice cream man. I don't know if y'all had those in Winsboro. Did you have that, Miranda? I mean, uh, uh, no, because I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Mesquite. And yes, yeah. we had the ice cream guy. You had the ice. I remember yeah. when I was a kid, the ice cream man. He would come along in his truck. Usually, had stickers of popsicles and ice cream cones and other stuff that would tempt children. And uh, when we heard uh, those chimes come through the neighborhood. We would all go looking underneath furniture, and if mom's purse was available, we'd check in there too for uh, nickels and dimes and whatever we could get in order to go out and buy a treat. Well, that happened, uh, the devotional guide said, in the life of a, a young lady. Uh, and uh, she said, children would come from all around to buy ice cream, but she said, there were not many nickels and dimes to be had in my house. So I had to hold back and watch the other kids get their treats. She said this ice cream man, after a while, kind of noticed this girl kind of standing off in the distance. And he said to her, come here. And she came over. And she said, uh, do I see carrots planted in the garden over there in your yard? And uh, she said, yeah, those are carrots. She said, well, I'm fond of carrots. If you bring me from some carrots, I'll give you some ice cream. How about that? And she went and got the carrots and came back and got her treat. And he said the ice cream man kept up that deal with her for some time. And she said in the course of writing that devotional, she said, I don't know if he realized it, but that man made the love of God known to me. He didn't embarrass me. He didn't put me on the spot. But he let me know that I mattered and that he wanted me to have a treat as well. You and I are called to that kind of ministry, to find perhaps our own unique way of making God known 